Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome you to the first panel dialogue of the five part series titled Unsettled Ethical Issues in Gene Drive Research. My name is Rafi Kilias and I'm the program manager at McMaster University's Institute on Ethics and Policy for Innovation, also known as IEPI. This series produced through the Gene Drive Research Forum is the product of a collaboration between IAPI and FNIH Gene Convening Global Collaborative. Through this panel discussion series, we intend to explore burning ethical concerns related to research, testing, and implementation of gene drive technologies for applications to improve public health, to preserve biodiversity, and to address food security concerns. This first session, centered on the question of whether there is moral difference between the natural and synthetic, is moderated by Dr. Fredros Okuni. He is the Director of Science at the Ifakara Health Institute and is a public health researcher and a mosquito biologist working on improved approaches for control of vector-borne diseases. He serves in various advisory groups, including WHO's Malaria Policy Advisory Group and the Gates Foundation's Malaria Strategic Advisory Panel. Dr. Fedros is also passionate about improving ecosystems for young researchers in Africa. And with that, Dr. Fedros, I'll pass this session to you. Thank you, Rafik. A warm welcome to everybody. Uh, Rafik, I hope you can hear me well. Uh, I hope this is, this is good. Thank you so much for the introduction. A very warm welcome to everybody joining us today and virtually uh, for what promises to be a very exciting conversation. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to having this engagement with you guys. Uh, we have a number of questions that we're going to be discussing today on the question of the natural versus the synthetic. Now, in the final hour or so of the session, I will pose a number of questions to our panelists. But first of all, I would like to begin by introducing the panelists with whom we're going to have this conversation today. So the first person we have is uh, Dr. Matthew Grillet. Matthew is a research lead uh, on the ethics of innovation and emerging technologies at McMaster University, the Institute on Ethics and Policy Innovation. Matt previously worked as an assistant professor at McMaster University, where he taught in the Justice, Political, Philosophy, and Law program. We also have Ramya Rajagopalan. Uh, Ramya, I have to, to try and pronounce this the second time. Ramya Rajagopalan. Uh, Dr. Ramya is an associate director, uh, is the associate director of training, evaluation, and quantitative research at the Center for Empathy and Technology in the T. Denny Sanford Institute for Empathy and Compassion at the Herbert Wethen School of Public Health and Human Longevity Sciences in the University of California, San Diego. Ramya is a sociologist by training. Um, she practices sociology of science, technology, and medicine. Uh, and her work examines the social and ethical dimensions of genome technologies for public health. The third panelist we have is Dr. Kent Renford. Uh, Kent uh, Renford is a principal at the Archipelago, Archipelago Consulting, uh, which is designed to help individuals and organizations improve their practice of uh, conservation. Kent has worked uh, with the Global Environment Facility, the U.S. National Park Services, the private, many private foundations, and other conservation activities. Among other relevant experience, he has spent seven years working at the intersection of conservation and synthetic biology, and he currently serves as the chair of the um, IUCN's task force on synthetic biology and biodiversity conservation. Lastly, we have Anna Wienhus. Anna is a postdoctoral researcher at the Ethics Research Institute at the Department of Philosophy and is affiliated with the University Research Priority Program on Global Change and Biodiversity at the University of Zurich. Anna holds a PhD in political theory from the University of Manchester. Her work currently focuses on environmental ethics, such as biocentric perspectives on the moral standing and the green political theory such as questions on interspecies and environmental justice. I would like to begin by sending our gratitude, a sincere thanks to all of you and all our panelists in, in particular for joining us uh, today. I believe uh, that this is really the right time to jump right into the conversation. And uh, to begin with, actually, I'm going to invite uh, each one of our panelists to give their introductory remarks. I suggest we begin with uh, Kent. 
Greetings to everybody and thank you for joining us for what uh, we anticipate will be a very uh, provocative and interesting conversation. So as Fred Fredros has said, I am a, a practicing conservationist for 30 years in the field. And the, the relevant experience for our, our conversation today, I think is really in two parts. One, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature exercise to which he made reference where we put together a group of people to look at this intersection, impending intersection between synthetic biology and conservation. And it proved to be a very contentious exercise. And we can get into some of that uh, during the course of this conversation. And second, with my colleague, uh, Bill Adams from Cambridge, we have just completed a book called Strange Natures that looks, uh, that looks at this intersection and asks some of the questions that we're gonna be treating today. So, I was very taken with a book I read a couple of years ago called Gods and Robots by Adrian Mayer. And she lays out the case for the deep antiquity of this dynamic between the artificial and the natural, uh, documenting the Greek, the classical Greek traditions and their fascination with what they regarded as the distinction between that which is made and that which is born which really translates to the same kinds of language that we're talking about today. And it's a fascinating treatment that reflects the fact that this has been a duality that has concerned people for a, for a very long time. So if we think about the kind of world we live in today, and I pick three examples for you, everyone will have their favorites. In Phoenix, Arizona, which is a very hot place if you haven't been there, there are small birds, small parrots called lovebirds, which are an invasive species native to Southern Africa, which can only survive in the high temperatures of Phoenix because they have discovered that they can hang out in the vents of air conditioners of large buildings when the weather is really hot. Or the University of Washington has developed something that is a combination between the living antenna of a moth and a drone which allows the drone to be manipulated by the human hand using the detection capacity of the moth antenna to detect odors. And finally, uh, as an example, engineering microbes, bacteria in particular, and then placing them within the human body to serve as sensors for what else is going on in the microbial community. In fact, we are living in a world in which the distinction between what is natural and what is artificial it, it may no longer serve our purpose. And, we look forward to having that conversation today. But if you look at conservation, conservation actively uses fire, fences, shooting of predators, camera traps, drones, environmental DNA, all sorts of technologies in order to save nature. So we are already deeply invested in the use of technology to save nature. What is new for us now is the question about the use of genetic tools as a way to try to save nature really elevating the question of, can you save nature? Can you change nature in order to save it? And this is an active question. Many of you will know different friends. I just raised two in case you're not familiar. There is a lot of research going on about changing the genetics of corals so that they can survive uh, warming and increasingly acidifying oceans. Or use of gene drives relevant to this particular conversation in invasive rodents in order to save endangered seabirds and islands. So we are left with a very complicated set of questions and fortunately I have a set of skilled people today and I look forward to the conversation and continuing the points that are of interest. Thank you, Fredericks. Thank you, thank you very, very much, uh, uh, Kent, for the introductory remarks. And as Kent was saying, and this is really meant to be an open conversation. I, I have to add that there will be no bounds in this conversation, uh, uh, as, as Kent introduced this, uh, probably um, a very fine line between what is natural and what is synthetic. And it will be exciting to explore uh, what this uh, looks like, with, especially with regard to the technology of gene drives uh, as used for multiple purposes, including in biodiversity and public health. Uh, the next uh, 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 panelist uh, to give my introductory remarks will be Ramya. So Ramya, if you wanna go ahead. Thank you, Fred Rose, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Very, very excited to be here and to have this conversation. Uh, what I wanted to do with a couple of minutes that I have um, with my comments is to ask us to um, 
turn this question a little bit back on itself, and I think this speaks to some of what Kent uh, just discussed. This moral question of whether there's you know, a moral difference between what we might circumscribe as the natural and what we might circumscribe as the synthetic. And I want us to ask during this conversation and to be thinking about what we mean by the natural and the synthetic and what do we, what do we intend to do when we invoke this binary or this duality, which opposes that which is human made, the synthetic, to that which is deemed natural or, or somehow outside of human creation or agency. And I bring a perspective from the interdisciplinary field of science and technology studies to questions like this. And within STS, we really kind of question a little bit this um, seemingly durable boundary between the natural and the synthetic. And it's complicated really by the observation that, you know, we have this very complex world that we live in, interspecies relations in which we are interacting with living alongside millions of other species, many of which we don't even know exist yet. And so our interactions and relationships with these other species are active, they're dynamic, they're extremely adaptive. There's one thing we've learned even with the, the current crisis with the pandemic, is that organisms are extremely adaptive. And importantly, these relations are mediated by all the things that we create. And that includes our technologies, but it also includes our social infrastructures, our medical and health infrastructures, our financial infrastructures, all of these that become materially and semiotically entangled with the physical lives and with the biological lives of practically every ecological web on the planet. And so there's lots of examples. We can talk a little bit, I think, about the pandemic and how that has sort of um, infiltrated into all aspects of life in the biosphere. There's the example of human generated trash and waste, right, resulting from our manufacturing and industrial processes. These are all firmly entrenched, right, largely disruptive components, but components nonetheless of every major ecosystem on the planet. And of course, We've been modifying the genetics of other species for thousands of years before we had any kind of gene editing technology. We've been doing that through plant breeding. Um, and that has radically altered the makeup and the diversity of our biosphere. And so all of this sort of makes this line between the natural and the synthetic that much more fuzzy. Um, and so because that boundary is very porous, what we in STS like to do is focus less on defining that, that barn boundary rather on understanding the politics of those boundaries. Whose interests do such boundaries serve? And how might we approach what those boundaries seek to separate in ways that really help to advance a global or a collective well-being? Um, and of course, with respect to the synthetic, the technologies we design are playing a critical role in shaping social processes and ecological processes on the planet. And importantly, technologies are the result of human designs. They emerge from human social interests and human objectives. And so these objectives themselves are of interest because they help us to answer what's at stake in the use of a particular technology. And the other part of the answer, of course, comes from the impact that those designs and those technologies have, not just on human political and social worlds, but also on the non-human life webs that we live within. And so the ways that technology shapes or reshapes our interactions with the entire world around us, um, potentially even more acute with a technology like gene drive, really helps us to kind of outline and delineate the ways in which um, we need to be thinking about how we steward, uh, how, we, how we serve as responsible stewards um, for the planet and for the, all of the webs into which our actions have uh, an impact. Um, the one other thing I'd just like to add to the conversation um, is to have us be thinking about how can we start to decolonize the ways we approach and respond to some of these issues of the boundaries between the natural and the synthetic. And so I suggest that we consider questions like, you know, for whom might it matter whether there's a moral philosophical uh, divide between the natural and the synthetic and these sort of panics about tampering with nature? And how can we think about the ways in which other priorities might play a larger role in people's lives in terms of their willingness or their ability to, um, to mediate nature in ways that enhance human lives. And so these types of concerns can help us reframe some of these questions about the proper relationship between science and society in ways that really emphasize justice, that emphasize human rights, and that emphasize an engagement with the public interest and with protecting the ecological commons around us. So thank you very much. And I really look forward to the discussion ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Ramia. And, and of course, with your expertise working on the uh, genome sciences um, as a technology, 
uh, we're looking forward to even greater insights from you today. One word that I heard you use is uh, tempering with the natural world. And um, you know, one of the questions we're gonna ask today is whether the language that we use also matters. So uh, there are people who believe that it is not really a question of tempering, but rather uh, uh, doing what is necessary to preserve um, the natural world. So, I mean, you you were very categorical on the not, the fact that it's not so necessary to define the, the line between the natural and the synthetic. And I think these two will be an important question going forward. So next we'll hear from Matthew, and then last we'll hear from Anna. So Matthew, please. Uh, thanks, Fritis. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I come to this talk as a philosopher who currently works on the ethics of emerging technology. In this space, there's a fair amount of excitement about the promise of synthetic biology and especially synthetic gene drive technologies. And yet for some, as we've heard, there's an uneasiness associated with synthetic gene drives that has to do with the seeming unnaturalness of its processes or of its products. Indeed, a few commentators have gone so far as to suggest that this unnaturalness is tied to a set of full-blown moral problems with the use of this technology. For example, they suggest that the use of synthetic gene drives amounts to an attack on the intrinsic good of the natural world, or that the use of this technology will lead human beings into a self-destructive sense of mastery over their environment. As philosophers, we like to engage with these sorts of arguments, qua arguments. So in response, some scholars have sought to dissolve away these worries by defining the problem away. We've heard talk of that already today. So some scholars will claim that either synthetic gene drives are actually quite natural, and hence can't be morally faulted for their unnaturalness, or they claim that thanks to human created phenomena, such as global warming, there's nothing left on earth that's truly natural, and so synthetic gene drives aren't introducing any more unnaturalness into the world than is already there. While some do certainly find these responses appealing, um, I'm not yet convinced of their conceptual accuracy or of their helpfulness in moving the conversation along with the people who are making these arguments. Rather, I tend to think the concerns of unnaturalness ought to be considered head on. That is, I believe we ought to give the most generous interpretation of these criticisms from unnaturalness that we can to see if they do identify any serious moral problems with the processes or products of synthetic gene drives. A current sense though, is that when we do this, when we take our time and work through the critiques of synthetic gene drives that are based on unnaturalness, it turns out that none stand out as being especially compelling. This is not to say that synthetic gene drives couldn't be horribly misused and abused, of course they could be, but they might also be employed to do a great deal of good in the world, as is exemplified by the great promise that they hold for combating mosquito-borne illnesses such as malaria. This suggests that in addition to arguments for naturalness, our moral attention should also be focused on thinking about how to use this powerful new technology responsibly. That is, we need to think through questions about what counts as an acceptable versus an unacceptable use case for synthetic gene drives. And we need to think about what sorts of institutions are best situated to employ this technology and what degree of public education and public assent would confer legitimacy upon the use of this technology and so on. So in short, I think that it's worth uh, talking about the issue of gene drives on naturalness and doing so seriously even if this is just one part of a much larger conversation. And it's with this thought in mind that I'm very much looking forward to participating in and learning from today's discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Matthew. In my professional community, it's very rare that we have a conversation with a philosopher. So welcome. And, and, and thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, it means, therefore, that you can help us answer the, 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 the wider question um, in relation to this, some of these technologies as to whether human-created technology can actually, actually constitutes part of our natural evolution. You know, what will future generations uh, think about, about us? Will they think about this as something that was formerly synthetic but is now natural? the same way we think about fire and language, or should we actually just say, this is a no-go? So some of these conversations, we will have them uh, going forward, but as you said, it would be really, really nice to try and focus them on the issue of today, which is the gene drive technology, and how the entire philosophical argument uh, can be used to frame some of this, the bad and the good, and then the balancing off of that. Lastly, we will hear from Anna. Uh, Anna, welcome. Um, thank you very much, Fred Rose, and um, hello to everyone. I think um, 
Well, my two cents on the issue, I guess, follow up nicely from what Matthew just said, because I'm also a philosopher, but I don't work at all in the debates about gene drives or the ethics of technology and so on, but I'm rather coming from the environmental ethics perspective to these questions. Um, so if, if people are interested in what really ethics of technology or environmental philosophers who work on the intersection of technology and environmental ethics have to say, I can point to other people who have said a lot of very interesting things about it. But the perspective I'm coming from here is looking at this in this more general sense, as also the panel today is called, is there more difference between the natural and the synthetic, looking at the question, well, whether and which and what kind of interventions into nature can be morally justified, which is the broader question in which we could um, situate the whole debate about gene drives. So on this very specific question, is there a moral difference between the natural and the scientific? Um, I would say yes, there is a difference actually. So I would say simply put, it matters morally whether something has been created by me or by other people and whether or whether it exists fully independent from me. And so the relationships we stand with other beings matter for explaining what we ought and ought not do, which I think is a general way most people think about ethics, relationships do matter. And the debate about naturalness or whether something is synthetic, artificial or wild on the other side is just one aspect of kind of explaining this um, relational situatedness we have as moral agents. So uh, for me, we can distinguish between something is more, whether something is more or less natural on one side or synthetic, artificial, or wild on the other side, just as a way of signalizing our moral positionality in the world as moral agents who have to make decisions about what we want to do. And specifically, not just as moral agents, but as humans, as a human community in the world. So just as a little example, so for instance, if I have a pet dog, which I unfortunately don't have, but in this ideal world, I would have a pet dog, I would stand in a different relationship with that dog um, to the specific non-human animal, then I'm standing, for instance, to a wild wolf. Um, I have to care for the dog, for instance, in a way that I don't have to care for the wild wolf, but I have other duties towards the wolf, which I would say my primary duties here is to leave it be and do its thing. And um, so this is just an easy way of kind of trying to explain that this natural synthetic distinction tries to pick up on the simple moral intuition there. So I would say simply put, we as humans are obviously part of nature. But being part of nature doesn't justify morally every changes we want to do to the environment. For that, we need to look at other justifications why we want to um, do things. And as Ramja already earlier pointed out nicely, with that, I don't mean that there are two distinct fears that on the one side we have the natural, on the other side we have the synthetic. Clearly, there are porous boundaries, things are very interrelated. Usually, people think about it as a gradient. But just because the question is difficult doesn't mean it doesn't matter, morally speaking. Um, and just on a last note, before we kind of come into the discussion, I think we should be careful about when we use those concepts. So for instance, when we say something is more or less natural, usually everybody here, and I think the other speakers before me already were a good example of this, have all employed naturalists in a slightly different way. Um, and so in that sense, we need to be careful when we, when we speak to each other what we mean by naturalness, because it can be employed in different ways, it can have different meanings in different contexts, and I would say not necessarily always it's morally relevant the way it is employed. And I would say it seems to be more one morally relevant consideration, but it's clearly not the only one, so it might be overwritten in certain contexts. Um, yes. Brilliant. Uh, th this is a wonderful uh, um, uh, startup, Anna. I particularly like the example you gave uh, with the domestication of animals, which itself is some form of technology, if you like. Um, and, and actually, I think we should use this to launch into the, the big questions and, 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 and uh, to ask our panelists to be as open-minded as possible. Uh, this is a difficult conversation, but a very important conversation as well. The other thing is that I ask our panelists to try and focus as much as possible on how we can use these uh, uh, arguments to frame the issues of, of gene drive technology going forward. 
But before we do that, I would just like to ask Anna one, one, one last question as she concludes her introductory remarks on whether we humans actually have a responsibility to preserve nature. Yes. So simply put, I think it boils down to that because we stand in a different relationships uh, to, to re relationship to things which we consider natural and then we can talk about what is natural or wild and what is domesticated and so on. I think primary we have a responsibility in terms of trying to preserve it. Um, obviously, that responsibility might be in some cases overruled by other moral relevant concerns, but that responsibility is there. Prima facie is something we need to take into consideration. Do all organisms have this responsibility? Uh, would you like me to carry on? Yeah. Yes. Please. Um, well, no. What I think is important that we think our as ourselves as moral agents within the environmental context. So, what we as um, ethicists, moral philosophers, and so on, trying to do is to think about from the moral human perspective as a human agent, how should we act in this world? Um, so it's not a way of prescribing to other organisms what they ought to do. Um, also, because as most people would agree, besides of maybe some type of um, mammals, other organisms don't, don't qualify as any type of moral agent in any way. So what this is also the specific positioning humans are in. We are moral agents, we are aware of this, and this comes then with certain duties that other living beings on this planet simply don't share, but they also don't have the power of changing the lives of the rest of the biosphere the way we can. So in that sense, this is very important. Thank you. A question to Kent. And, and Anna, I would like you to, to keep that thought actually, because you know later we're gonna ask you how we know we have this responsibility, whether it's our God-given responsibility or how, whether we give it to ourselves or, or so on. But I would like us to, to, to go back to Kent actually. Uh, Kent, when you started the conversation, right after you started this conversation, there were a lot of questions as to whether we should even consider this question of natural versus synthetic. So I would like to throw it back to you. Uh, um, <clears throat> to check if you can, you know, if, if you wish to reframe some of the, 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 the earlier remarks or, or broaden them rather. On the question of species, humans, plants and animals, do they matter morally in themselves independently of their being useful to us as humans? This is, um, this is a difficult uh, 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 conversation I said. So, you're free to frame it as broadly as you wish or as finely as you wish. Oh, well, thank you for the license. Um, so <laughs> in answer to your first question, no, I don't want to reframe my remarks at all. I've, I've, been, I've been through and still am in the culture wars on this topic. <laughs> and what I find, and I would be interested in, in Anna's comments at some point, because the major critics of that have spoken it to me and to the effort that I've been involved with, who have been very stridently against any consideration of the use of genetic technologies for conservation have been German. And I'm curious, I just, I have no idea whether that's simply a coincidence, um, uh, uh, whether it's a reflection of a certain worldview. Um, I, I don't know why. I mean, but but I find that very interesting. And and the strongest position that I have heard expressed is that um, genetic technologies are unnatural, which sometimes um, frames itself as humans have no right to play God, which I find an endlessly interesting observation. And I think all of you are more qualified to take on that question than I but it's used. Um, so the one thing that I would add uh, and to respond, uh, yeah, stimulated by Anna's, one of her first comments, Raymond Williams, who many of you may know is a literary scholar, and he says that the word nature and natural is arguably the most complicated word in the English language. 
So I don't know about the German language or French or, or Portuguese, but in English. And it's no wonder that it's get used in different ways by different people. What I think is interesting is that there are another set of words which are very rarely defined, like love and hate and jealousy and money, um, which also are very difficult to define, yet people tend to use them without questioning how somebody else means. So I don't know whether or not the natural, whether the, that, that observation about nature is any different than a, a small category of, of other words, but yeah. that's how I would respond to get us yeah. started. Yeah, yeah, Kent, uh, let us be a little academic here. Uh, we, you teach in an ethics program. Uh, oh, <laughs> I haven't been an academic for 20 years. So I know, I know, and, and, and this is, and, and this is why I'm asking that you try and pretend to be a little academic here. Mm. Considering the relationship between humans and the environment, in your opinion, what could be the potential impact, either positive or negative, of the engineered gene drive organisms on this relationship? Uh, so what I loved about Ramya's observation is that it allows me to escape from that question. Um, because now I'm a small <laughs> academic, I can slip between the gaps between uh, in the question. But, but I, what interests me is the, uh, is, what, is the nature of the boundary between what's good and what's bad. And who wants to ask that question and why? Yeah. Um, there is a concept that I have yet to find out. I don't know whether the rest of you go through your lives using the notion of counterfactuals. Is that something people do? So, yeah. right, so that's what would happen if I didn't do something. And I think that there's something intrinsic about humans to not use counterfactuals. So they say, well, what would happen if I did this? And then decide to do it or not do it based on that. Very rarely do they say, what would happen if I didn't do this? And I would compare that with what happens if I did do this. That just doesn't seem to be part of the human infra infrastructure. But it's an extremely important point for thinking about the question you asked me, Fredericks, because the, I, so I want to give back to you and to the group my reframing of that question, which is, is what is happening, is what will happen to nature worse if we do deploy genetic technologies or worse if we don't deploy them? Because the trend lines are terrible. So if we don't do anything, it's not gonna be fine. It's gonna get worse. So that makes it a much more complicated and to me more interesting question about whether we should deploy these technologies. And I'll leave it to others to comment. Thank you. No, th th thank you. Thank you very much. And, and again, that ties very well to what Anna said earlier. Uh, the question of what will happen if we do or we don't do something. Uh, ties very well to whether we actually have a responsibility to do or not do anything. But first, I want to go back to Ramya. Uh, uh, Ramya, uh, you work in a, a group with a lot of uh, people who would refer to themselves as empathists, or, or, or if you like. Um, but in your specific case, also very interested in genomic technologies. Now, in, in my village, uh, for, for certain individual children, uh, diseases such as malaria, constitute existential threats at individual level. In other words, they will kill you if you can't do something about it. And so if someone came with the technology that promises to do something and do it permanently, we would embrace that technology for that reason, mostly to preserve our own lives and maybe the lives of others. I guess an, an important question here from, from, from a, a ethics perspective, usually generally we consider society, uh, we consider the public health ethics, we consider the individual research ethics, but we also consider the natural environment, the, the environmental ethics. And in this, there are people who argue that human beings are just one part of the ecosystem. There are others who argue that human beings and the ecosystem are the same. I would like to hear from you, Ramya, what do you think 
are the, ethic, the major ethical concerns associated with gene drives, if any. And whether in your community uh, uh, of practice, there are really uh, serious things that we must consider to make this useful. Back to you, Robin. Thanks, Redros. You've given me a very tiny question to respond to, so thank you. For you that. can expand it. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I'm, I'm being ironic. I think that there are indeed um, a vast uh, array of ethical questions that attend the use of gene drive technologies. Um, I wanted to just briefly circle back to this question of the, you know, the fuzziness that I sort of pointed to a little bit provocatively between the natural and the synthetic. To note that I, I didn't mean to diffuse when I made my comments, I didn't mean to diffuse any notion of responsibility or obligation that humans might have towards other life on Earth. Rather, I, I meant to, um, uh, to enhance our discussion of that and to really sort of refocus the terrain upon which we are thinking about the various justifications for or against the use of a technology like gene drive. And uh, you know, you talked a little bit about my positioning right now in an institute that that uh, is really focused on the intersection between empathy and technology, and how our technologies can be used to enact empathies to each other towards other beings on the planet, but also potentially to disrupt some of those relations. And I think, um, you know, it's really in that space of understanding whether our technologies are disruptive or whether they are enhancing of or uh, delivering solutions to the problems that we identify, those are the cracks that sort of expose some of these um, ethical um, contested terrains upon which, uh, you know, the gene drive discussion is playing out right now on, on the international stage. And so in terms of the, the ethical questions that arise, I think, one aspect of this that we have to sort of keep at the top of our heads as we discuss these issues is um, to whom or uh, to which groups or collectives in our societies do these various ethical uh, interests, ethical values, ethical questions, um, who are they most important to, right? And so what we see on, when we analyze the ethics of gene drive, for example, is that the environmental ethicists may have very different values and very, very different priorities from those who are interested in public health, for example. And you brought up this um, one application of gene drive for uh, potentially addressing the problem of malaria, which, as you pointed out, is a widespread problem, a devastating problem, especially for children under five, especially in countries uh, that are considered to be the global south, right? And so that dynamic, bringing in that understanding of the sort of the um, differential in power and equity that arises in the very design and development and deployment of some of our technologies is really critical for unpacking some of the ethical questions that come up. Questions around, you know, who gets to make these decisions about which technologies or which approaches we use to solve our problems? Who gets to define where the, what the problem is and what the source or the cause of that problem is, right? And so the gene drive approach uh, prioritizes a particular way of addressing the problem of malaria, for example. But there are other potential ways of addressing the problem of malaria that arguably uh, could have uh, more of an impact on not just malaria, but on a host of other diseases as we see COVID today that ravage, right, especially societies, especially communities where there is a lack of resources, there is a lack of equity, um, there are these sort of health disparities that are existing not because of some innate biological difference between communities living in the global north and the global south, but because of that access to resources, the access to power and the access to voice. And so I think when thinking about some of these ethical issues around gene drive, we really do have to be critically bringing in these discussions about, you know, whose uh, priorities are coming to play an impact in these decisions, how are these decisions made, and whose voice is at the table, and how can we make um, strides towards solving some of these problems that really seek to include uh, a diverse array of voices and really seek to represent a diverse array of voices in understanding what the problem is and in delivering a solution to that problem. So I'm not sure if I really answered your question, but 
I hope in a roundabout way, I've uh, brought up some more uh, potential material for discussing further in this uh, webinar today. Yeah, a great, great, great path um, in, in the direction that I think all of us would wish to go. Uh, before we conclude, and, and Matt, I'm going to come to you right, right, right after this. But before we con conclude, Ramia, when you say, when you ask the question, who makes the decision? In your mind, which groups are you thinking about? Well, I think in any decision making process, in any governance of any technology, right, there are experts or those individuals who are perceived to be experts on the technology, and they can be scientific mm -hmm. experts, they can be regulatory experts, they can be government experts, right? Mm -hmm. There are also individuals who will be directly impacted by the technology who are maybe less represented in some of those discussions around the decision to use or not to use in a technology, as well as the decisions around, you know, how do we assess the risk of this technology? How do we assess the benefits of this technology? And how do we make comparisons between the risks and benefits that are, um, that, that represent the positionality of those different stakeholders? So for example, the benefits and risks of gene drive could be viewed very differently by somebody yeah. who is in favor of gene drives versus somebody who sees potential um, potential ecological impacts or other potential social impacts that could arise from you know, privileging a gene drive technology over other potential approaches. And so just understanding and making sure that all of those sort of positionalities are transparent in that decision-making process, but also um, tailor, you know, sort of directing our decision-making processes away from the sort of top-down decisions that have typically attended the uses of technologies from you know, nuclear technologies to uh, you know, genetically modified organisms, for example, and really sort of thinking a little bit more about how do we include some of those voices, those other stakeholders who may have very critical expertise to bring to the table, who may not yeah. necessarily be opposed to the technology per se, but are really interested in helping to make that technology uh, into something that will address the problem in a way that's going to benefit the most number of people. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. And, and uh, we will come back to that. Uh, Matthew, before I ask you the question, I would like you to extend this conversation that Ramya was having uh, by answering the question as to whether in cases where we have experts, uh, globally or internationally acclaimed experts, can we trust them to make the right decision for technologies associated with gene drives? Okay, so I think there's a couple of questions that get folded into that that I might want to unpack just a little bit. Right. right. So on the one hand, experts often have power, right? And so there's really two questions. There's what do we mean by an expert and does an expert entail someone with power and what does that relationship look like? So if by expert, you mean someone uh, who has um, specific training and uses reason and the scientific method, right? Then that can give them a privileged epistemic perspective. They may simply know more by dint of their training and their expertise. It doesn't mean that they have exclusive expertise that someone is an expert does not mean that there are not other experts, and it does not mean that they don't have other sources of expertise that we should turn to, right? Experts don't, don't exist in a vacuum. So it's important that when we talk about who an expert is, we're not suggesting that they are a unique voice, many Correct. people, right? Um, so I do think that expertise is important while admitting that there are different sorts of expertise and all should be incorporated. Um, there's a separate question as to who is, who's driving the car. Who's at the wheel? Who has the power? And um, in the case of who's driving the wheel, when it comes to the unnatural synthetic dispute and synthetic biology and you know geoengineering and these sorts of emergent technologies, it's an incredibly complicated story, right? There are uh, nationalist interests, corporate interests, um, political interests, geopolitical interests. All of it's at stake, and all of it influences how the decisions go one way or another. There are also bottom-up interests, right? Uh, more yeah. than ever, people on the ground are having a voice in these, dispute, in these disputes and debates when they didn't before. So there are some actual positive things happening in terms of who's empowered. And positive things in terms of who we identify as an expert. Indigenous expertise is now being recognized in ways that it never was before. Um, so I just think it's a very complicated story on both fronts. But I do think that it doesn't mean that we should disregard the notion of expert or demean it if all we mean by expert is someone who has dedicated themselves to learning as much as they can and applying through reason uh, to the problem at hand. Um, the development of science is testament to the power of expertise. 
Thank you. Thank you. And, and that brings me to uh, the, the question that we had wanted to ask you earlier as a, as a philosopher, again, uh, and, and listen carefully because it's a broad question, but an important one. Given that there are fundamental ethical and philosophical disagreements between what is right and what is wrong with regard to technologies, and in this case, with specific focus on gene drive, how can we best approach or contextualize, if you like, these disagreements to lend perspectives to good debates on this issue of whether we can uh, we can we can uh, continue with the development and eventually deployment of these technologies. Okay, so I think it's a testament to what's already gone on in this discussion that you're seeing this issue be contextualized. We're seeing inputs from somebody trained in STS is giving us a kind of sense of what's politically going on in the background of these right. debates and how the politics has shaped it. That's incredibly important to understand. Right. You're seeing somebody who's been active in conservation, you know, kind of informing the debate, informing the discussion through you know, personal conversations and a history of professional expertise. Right. You're seeing Anna, who's already kind of suggested important philosophical assessments, right, noting that the use of a category may entail a value judgment somewhere operating in the background, um, even in somebody trained philosophy. Right. We can smuggle values in. Um, so to that extent, I think it's incredibly important to contextualize the debates and to understand that when somebody makes an assertion of naturalness or unnaturalness or even the merits or demerits of a given technology, that there's a lot going on in the background that we need to understand. Um, you know, all that said, I come from a perspective where one of the things that is also very, very important to understand is that when we're arguing ethically, we are reducing reasons that are meant to convince people about how to behave. And if we can show that their reasoning is good, if their reasoning is sound, then we should agree with them. If it turns out someone can have a knockdown argument about the evil of unnaturalness and the unnaturalness of gene drive, if it's a sound argument, then we, have, we now have reason to believe it. And that can change how we relate to it. The flip side is, if someone fails to establish um, either the naturalness or the wrongness of unnaturalness of gene drive, and again, that tends to be my view on these things at this point, is that there are no really compelling yeah. arguments about its wrongness or evilness <clears throat> inherent to it. Um, then we need to take that seriously, not just as a political assessment, not just as a matter of kind of what we've observed through debates, but as a reason for belief. Is this something that is specific to uh, genetic technologies? Uh, I mean, someone just put on the chat here a question to all the panelists, which, which I think really fit, fits very well uh, with this. There are many, many other medicines or other technologies that are also not natural at all. Uh, and, and these questions don't come up. So are, are we being very selective uh, in this regard? And, and what, what really uh, can we do to, to make sure that the good thing is used, the bad one is not? Okay, so I mean, one of the interesting challenges that you face if you're trying to argue for the wrongness of synthetic gene drive, for example, is yeah, what does distinguish it from other obviously unnatural technologies, mm -hmm. right? That makes it so wrong. And um, you know, some scholars have tried to point out and tried to argue that it represents a particular tipping point, right? Um, for example, there's a, there's a recent argument, a fascinating argument by a very intelligent person, but not one I'm sympathetic to. And it suggests that it suggests that it's okay to manufacture completely artificial things and it's okay to domesticate, right? But that this middle line where you blur the distinction between artificiality and domestication of the wild, something in there is going to lead human beings, um, to lose respect for our environment, right? That somehow that this hasn't really been a problem, that this is the tipping point. And it's hard to understand why this is. So that really is the challenge, you know, uh, or at least one of the challenges of anyone who are, wants to argue for, for the kind of the principled wrongness with gene driving. Why this, right? Why not, you know, the horrors of climate change? Um, global warming, nuclear weapons, um, you know, um, large-scale industrial farming. Why weren't those the things that was going to tip us over into losing respect for nature? Um, so it's a very astute question, right? Um, yeah. you, you will notice, though, that throughout history, this, this gets brought up again and again. And, and, you know, I think that Ken will have seen this in studying the history of the use of this, this kind of term as, as a, a, a moral rejection of something new that, that very, very often, um, you know, if you go look this up online, you'll see examples involving the automobile was supposed to 
to ruin us. Um, and then in vitro fertilization was supposed to be, I mean, the Catholic Church opposed it vehemently as, as the kind of final step away from our natural state. Um, not to not Catholics, but it was just, it became, right? At each juncture, yeah. these new technologies, these very cutting edge technologies, especially the ones that mess with that natural synthetic distinction, right, right. Um, are, are, are one at a time made subject to the same sort of critique that this is the end of the line for us. This is where it all goes downhill. Right. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Matteo. Uh, uh, um, Anna, before I come to you, I would like to bring this question back to, to, uh, to Kent. Um, uh, Kent, you work with the IUCN. Um, uh, you, you have a, a lot of experience working on this, uh, doing these conversations of what constitutes national versus synthetic. I, I'd like to carry the question that Matt raised earlier, that some of the comments Matt raised earlier, and post them directly to you. And here the question is, could engineered gene drive organisms be considered as nature-based solutions uh, in the context of the IUCN uh, guidelines? So it's a provocative question, and uh, it's one that I've asked. Um, I, I I do not represent IUCN, so I'm not. Whatever I say mm -hmm. on this doesn't mean that's what IUCN says on it. They have 1,300 members who can't agree on most things, so I'm sure they wouldn't agree on this. Yeah. I would. So I've been pondering this question, and I think the answer is that certainly in its common usage on nature-based solution is the deploying of nature to achieve outcomes that are a benefit to humans and nature. And they, they, do not, right. they do not include, I think the argument would go, altering nature in order to use nature for the benefit of humans. Now, you could argue that planting mangrove trees where they didn't used to be is no significant difference than altering, creating an engineered gene drive. Then I think you're, you're into a detailed conversation, but I think that, it's, that it would shock the advocates of nature-based solution that someone was preparing to ride gene drive, ride a gene drive into their, <laughs> into the world of implementation based on their logic. Um, but I think you could make the case for that, for not yeah, being so thrown out of the party because you came with an invitation <laughs> that's a nature-based solution, so. In, in your opinion, in, in, in a practical sense, how, how would we escape this controversy that arises when people frame this question as a binary question of natural versus synthetic? What, yeah, yeah. What, what, how do we frame it so that you know, this, this uh, controversy does not, does not arise? Well, I consider myself a, um, a tiny academic in the presence of Matthew, Ramya, and Nana, because I don't know how to answer really big questions that are independent of context. Right. So I personally think, and the suggestion we made in this assessment, I see an assessment, was that it was wrong to try and answer a question globally. It was right to answer it in the context of an identified problem with identified stakeholders who could be consulted and Excellent. And, and a decision could be made. I love this conversation about expertise and I love Matthew's phrase of smuggling values in because <laughs> if we had customs agents to check uh, for smuggled values, man, I don't think most people would get into conversations in the world <laughs> of conservation, they'd be left out. Thank, thank um, you so much, Kent. Uh, uh, let, me, let me throw it to Anne uh, now that you raised this. So Anna, uh, guide us through this. Uh, Kent suggests that you might be better at answering this question of how we avoid the controversy arising from the question of binary, uh, the question of synthetic versus naturalness, uh, in, in particular with gene drive technologies, given that a lot of it is actually already naturally existing and that we have some synthetic versions that are being developed in the lab to serve very specific purposes uh, in, uh, um, in uh, biodiversity and also in public health and several other uses, uh, generally uh, for useful purposes. How do we frame this so that it is non-controversial and more ethics, ethical, if you like? So how do we frame this in a way that is non-controversial? Right. Okay, this is a big question, and I don't think I can give you the answer you would 
like to hear because I doubt that you can frame it in a way that would be uncontroversial for one person or the other, because each framing tells a story. Even if you try, you know, as I'm trying to do, provide pluralist inclusive framings, they're not going to be all inclusive. They're all going to tell a particular story of a situation that is going to not tell other stories. So I doubt that you can put it in a way that is uncontroversial for everybody. I think in order to make it, to broaden the narrative in a way where more people can actually be part of the con con conversation would be to frame it more broadly. It's obviously not a natural synthetic distinction question only. Right. Maybe it's not, I, I, I personally wouldn't even think it's the primary question to ask. Um, I don't think that whether something is more or less natural is the ultimate moral consideration that we have to turn to before we ask other questions. I think it's one relevant question, but I wouldn't necessarily think it's a primary one. So already, so already the title of this panel provides a certain framing where I would say, well, maybe this is not the right framing to think about it at all, to think about it in natural scientific, uh, synthetic or natural artificial distinction at all. Particularly, as also Matthew has pointed out, all of these terms are very contested. We mean very different things by them. Right. And not always, as already mentioned earlier, not always this is morally relevant. So when I use this idea of, you know, relationships matter and say naturalness is one way of explaining this, I use naturalness here in a way which is not at all like the, like the people that would, for instance, uh, consider um, IVF unnatural and therefore problematic. They use naturalness as a sense of what is normal, which is a very different way of naturalness um, that I'm employing here. So in that sense, I would say we need to broaden the question and think, okay, there are a lot of different morally and um, ethical questions in this context. All of them need to be considered. If we have done all this, which I'm not necessarily the right person to do because there are so many issues, environmental ethics is just one question, then you have questions about public health, which are very important, um, uh -huh. questions about political in political philosophy context, obviously, all the questions about power, justice, political legitimacy that Ramja also brought in, all the questions about ethics and technology and so on. Um, yeah. obviously, so on the mm -hmm. On that specific point, I mean, Kent was mentioning earlier that you cannot answer some of these questions broadly, but if applied to a specific uh, uh, um, concern, that there might be a, a lot more definitive action points. Uh, on, on the question of uh, uh, environmental ethics, we were saying earlier, there are people who, who, who take the view that humans are just one part of it. Uh, there are those who take the view that humans are the most important part of the environment and therefore have a responsibility, like you were saying, to, to preserve nature. Talk to us a little bit how you frame gene drives uh, in this context. Okay, well, I mean, firstly, maybe coming back to what Ken said, I very much agree with him that especially in this context, we have to have a case by case assessment. So we can have general theories about naturalness, we can have general theories about the moral standing of non-human beings and so on, but all of these are only going to be relevant if we then apply them to specific contexts. So I think there, I would disagree that there's a way of showing that, for instance, gene drives are inherently wrong or they're always right. So obviously, so I would say, obviously, based on the context, what our intentions are, what the consequences are, what our considerations we have to take into account, they might be justified, they might not. Um, obviously, from an environmental ethics perspective, I would say there's reason for caution, at least. Right. Um, but putting that aside, um, regarding the what you are, um, alluded to in your question is the question, okay, what is the moral standing of non-human beings? This whole question, do we take an anthropocentric perspective, which means only humans matter morally, or do we take a kind of a broader, more inclusive perspective that most environmental ethicists would um, take where you again have different options. So you have 
typical animal ethics positions that would say, okay, but also all sentient beings, they matter as well, because we can harm them, they can suffer, we can see, surely we have to take that morally into account. There are people who would go further and say all living beings matter, because all of them can be harmed in the way in, in a certain right. way. We can see a tree uh, flourishing when things are going well for that tree, and we can harm it, we can cut it down, we can uh, stop a life process. And surely that is something that should be taken morally in co into consideration. That is the biocentric position, for instance. So here we have different positions on that. Um, and I would also argue, yes, those things have to be taken into account. I think there are good reasons to taking the moral standing of non-humans into account also in the context of gene drives, because in the end, it's different non-human beings who are technology altered, they are, or they are also impacted by it in terms of maybe their, their ecosystem is altered, we have changes there. And those things, I think, in a very inclusive moral account should be taken into account to see what the impact are on those beings that also matter morally. Right. Thank you so much. I mean, before we proceed, I just want to ask uh, Karen to just put a little chat text there uh, on how we are doing with time, um, uh, so we, we don't we don't exceed. But uh, Ramya, it's been a while since since <laughs> we had your voice on this. I want us to carry this conversation from Anna and ask you to to uh, you know guide us on whether once we identify these ethical and uh, environmental concerns, you could actually modify the gene drive technologies themselves to respond to those concerns rather than doing away with the technologies. So when you were talking earlier, you were saying yeah, there might be multiple methods of addressing this problem. In the example of malaria, you were saying there might be multiple interventions. Uh, the question here is, there are also multiple approaches to doing gene drives. So if one of them is not deemed ethical by a certain community, either because they are uh, they believe uh, that, that humans are just one part of the entire ecosystem, could you address this by changing the form, the actual form of the technology that you're deploying? In, in, in the case of the gene drive technologies for malaria control, we usually have separation drives versus uh, modification drives and, and is there room here to modify the approach rather than uh, doing away with the approach uh, in bid to respond to some of the ethical concerns um, uh, being raised? Back to you, Ram. Yeah, thanks, Fredros. I think that's a really important question. And I think, you know, taking a step back, it illuminates uh, some of what has motivated some discussion, at least, around uh, the ways in which technology design is, or perhaps isn't responsive to the concerns of the uh, stakeholders who will ultimately be using that technology or be in the midst of the deployment of that technology. And I think that particularly applies to gene drive. Um, how flexible are, are, are our design processes to be able to encompass and to include uh, the feedback and the, um, again, going back to Matthew's sort of very, yeah. um, very cogent, I think, discussion of the diversity of expertise, how do we incorporate some of those expertises back into the design of our technologies to, to, to really be responsive to some of those ethical concerns in a real time way in the technology design? I think that's a really important question with gene drive. Certainly, you know, going back to this question of um, some of the contention around, you know, how do we circumscribe the natural and the synthetic? I think part of that uh, discussion, at least in terms of gene drive, emerges from um, a resistance, we can say, to genetic modification writ large in, you know, what we might consider the non-human world. So individuals who have in the past opposed, for example, genetic modification of food crops, which has been critically important in many ways for, um, you know, helping to secure food security, at least in some nations, there are still individuals who might see that as somehow contravening, or again, going back to this, to this issue of language, right? Messing with or tampering with nature. And I use that, I use that, that, that techno that terminology because that is some of the ter terminology that emerges in this debate. It's not necessarily my terminology, but it is terminology that emerges in this debate about the natural versus the synthetic. Right. And so, 
to your question of whether a gene drive could be modified to be responsive to the concerns, I think it would be wonderful and fabulous if we had, you know, design processes built into our uh, development of technology that could be responsive to, to stakeholder concerns. But ultimately, if a gene drive technology is seen as or somehow perceived to be a genetic modification technology that continues a tradition of genetic modification from GMOs, which as we know, endured uh, a great political backlash, especially in Europe, um, less so I think in, the, in, in North America. But um, to, that, to that extent, um, genetic technology may always be seen as a genetic technology. And so even if you could engineer a drive that, you know, could fizzle out after a few generations or could somehow have some sort of molecular kill switch built into it that would ensure that, you know, if anything went out of control, it would sort of self-destruct, right, on command. Um, I think those might still be seen as genetic technologies and that that sort of, um, you know, the the exceptionalism, I think, that's afforded sometimes to genetic modification, going back to, you know, all the ways in which our technologies impact organisms, the specific ways in which we go into other genomes, other species genomes and modify them. There seems to be something very um, sort of triggering, I think, for lots of groups in terms of their understanding of what actually, what, what power that constitutes in terms of the ways in which we exert that power over other species. Yeah and whether it's really justified for us to be doing that. Um, and so I'm not sure that that, that really uh, you know, sort of addresses this question of whether gene drive could be responsive. I think there are ways in which it could be responsive to certain ethical concerns, but there are other ethical concerns that a gene drive may never be responsive to. And so to consider- and should, we, should we aim, um, sh should our aim be, and, and when I say we here, uh, forgive me, but I would like to, to for a moment, assume that I'm a pro gene drive group, should the aim be to address all the ethical concerns or just most of them? I'm sorry, should the aim be to address all of the ethical concerns? That was the question. Yeah, uh, or just some of them or most of them. I mean, that is a question that is, you know, going back to Kent's really um, wonderful point, something that takes place on the ground in very specific right. contexts and the ways in which particular gene drives are deployed for particular reasons and particular purposes, right? We've had gene drives being proposed now for conservation on islands. We have gene drives being proposed for addressing malaria and other vector-borne diseases. Um, and even within the sort of vector-borne disease field, the ways in which those vectors move, their local ecologies, the topology upon which they uh, sort of exert the the right. um, the infective processes that they that they mediate varies widely between different contexts, and so the ethical concerns I think are going to be local and particular in some ways. The way the particular framings of those ethical concerns will be local and particular, and I think the ways that gene drive designers or developers are responsive to that will partly be mediated by you know again coming back to these questions of who's got the sort of decision-making power, where does that power reside? Mm -hmm. And what concerns are they being asked to be particularly responsive to? And so coming back again to this question of how do we ensure that our processes are, our design processes for our technologies are as responsive as possible to be as inclusive as possible of all the concerns. There's, I don't think there'll ever be a situation where you could be responsible to, or responsive to all of the ethical concerns that come up because- Thank I you array of, of conflicting concerns in the gene drive field and so. Thank you. Matthew, I would like to hear from you any addition to the points that Ramya was making and feel free of course to uh, make the opposite points if you, if you want. Uh, but any addition to that, that specific um, uh, uh, idea and also if you could touch on to the points raised earlier by Kent on how do we address the specifics uh, on case by case basis so that we could still make use of the good sides of the tech uh, without, without, without causing problems. Back to you, Matt. Okay, okay. So you've handed me now two huge questions. So I will That's try right. and follow. Happily, I can basically agree with everything that Ram, you just said. Um, so one of the things that you find out is that um, there are some behaviors that are perfectly unproblematic. You know, hugging your baby, what could possibly be wrong with that? Um, but when we deal with complicated problems, very, very often, we have to weigh up competing considerations. 
right? Um, there are a million examples, right? Um, um, I can't even think of them, there's so many. Uh, you know, um, whether you should uh, give someone money who's asking for it on the side of the road, there can be competing considerations on both sides of that, what looks to be a very good charitable act, right? And when it comes to deciding between those competing reasons, um, you really need to get into the weeds. You really need to know the details. You need to see the truth of what's happening on the ground. You need to think beyond the kind of the, the researchers and the implementers and think about the larger context. And you'll find that very few things are problem free. And in many, many ways, we operate in tragic moral circumstances where our best yeah. will still end up being suboptimal. Yeah. Right? And that's just the reality that we face. And ethics uh, is the point of ethics is not to smooth things over and make it perfect. It's to help us see the full range of reasons that apply and understand what's going on when we make a decision, both good and bad. So ethics is not supposed to be the, the, the cleaner, you know, it's not, there's a phrase called ethics washing, and that's an abuse of ethics. Nothing should look clean or very few things will look perfectly clean after a good ethical analysis. There will be obvious trade-offs that we have to make. So, so again, complete Trends. agreement with Ramya on that point. Um, can you just reiterate um, what you wanted me to speak to with regards to, to Ken's comments? Ken's yeah, so it, it, it Kent had mentioned earlier that because we cannot address all the concerns, it would be in, in a broad space, it is necessary to consider every individual case for its merits and its disadvantages. And, and, and this might mean, you know, every application of gene drive, or it might mean every community where it's going to be to be uh, uh, used. And Kent, you can correct if I'm mis, mis, misphrasing this, but you, you know, people need help sometimes, and it's only in these technologies that they find help. You also have the ethical concerns, and the communities are not the same. Use cases are not the same. How? do we ensure that there's as minimal transgression as possible onto nature, that we do our best to preserve nature and also uh, abide as much as possible to the ethical concerns, address as much as possible the ethical concerns? Okay, so um, I'll speak to a couple of things at this point then. The first is this, right? And this has to do with how ethics operates. Um, there can be things that are just in principle wrong and wrong in a way that you should just never do it. Right. right. Um, murder is a perfect example. If you understand murder as the unjustified and, and kind of undefended killing of an innocent party, you just never do it. And no matter what good effects might come from murder, it's not something you do. So the first thing when you're dealing with the new technology like gene drive is see if there are any in principle, all things considered objections to it. What's interesting about the naturalness thing is they're often portrayed that way. You know, you'll see people saying, listen, it's unnatural and therefore wrong and therefore we should have a moratorium. And so, you know, as a philosopher, one of my first instincts is, is assess that immediately. It's not the whole picture. As Anna repeatedly points out, that is not the whole picture. But if there were um, a kind of principled block against the use of technology, we want to know and, and we want to be clear about it. Again, explored this. I don't think there is a principled argument against it. Right. So if there's not a principled argument against it, then you turn to the use cases, okay. Just because in principle it's not wrong doesn't mean it might not be abused, right? Or used beneficently. And so then the question comes down to figuring out what counts as a legitimate use case versus an illegitimate use case. And what are the features of a legitimate use case, right? What sorts of things make this okay to use? In what circumstances is it okay to employ gene drive? Now, I simply cannot possibly give you an answer as to all the features of an acceptable use case. Um, but I can tell you something that comes up repeatedly within the context of the, the kind of unnaturalist arguments against gene drive. The proponents of this unnaturalist argument maybe like to gloss over, and I, th I think it's a mistake that they do. Um, and this is that gene drive, uh, synthetic gene drives, right, uh, can have three basic functions and quite different functions. You could use a gene drive uh, for population suppression, right? Um, and we see this um, in conservation of, uh, conservationist ethic efforts uh, where they're considering uh, reducing rodent populations in certain islands, right? Uh, you could use gene drive um, and other forms of synthetic biology to create what is in effect a domesticated species, right? You adjust a species such that it would um, result in a product that you could harvest or a service that you can make use of, right? 
Um, but gene drive doesn't require either of these two things. You could make what you might think of as a non-domesticating alteration to a species. It doesn't kill it, right? And, and that doesn't render it a product or a service. It just, for example, removes a dangerous element of that species behavior. And in the research into synthetic gene drives regarding uh, mosquitoes from malaria, uh, there are two approaches. One is a population suppression approach, which is being investigated. But the other is approach um, to uh, introduce a gene drive whose cargo will be a, a, an inability for the mosquito to fully develop the malaria parasite. Right? So the only alteration you'd be making with gene drive, you don't adjust the phenotype of the animal, you don't adjust yeah. its environmental mm -hmm. activities, all you're doing is preventing, basically turning off the malaria switch. And if you do that, you're not domesticating it, at least not obviously, and you're not killing it. And so it turns out that gene drive is amenable with a variety of uses. Right? And so some of the things that, that, you know, and I think Rami said this again, it, you know, genetic modification is a very triggering thing. Um, but one of the things that really triggers people about gene drive is it's identified as being a species killer. And it's not necessarily. Yeah. That's the first thing. The second thing is, um, this is what I'm about to say is much more provocative, and I'm not sure that I have any conclusions on it. But there may be circumstances under which it is warranted to eliminate a species. And the argument about gene drive from, for uh, mosquito suppression is precisely that, that when you're losing 400,000 people a year, you know, in terms of deaths from malaria and untold millions more are suffering horrible kind of morbidities from this, um, maybe that is the kind of thing that justifies um, the elimination or suppression of a population. Um, again, not giving a conclusion on that, not asserting a conclusion on it, but the point is, is that, is that gene drive, synthetic gene drives compatible with both these approaches. And as an right. ethicist, what we try and do is weigh up the merits of these various approaches, even to a singular problem like that, and find out that the moral variance is significant. And you need to compare them to each other and figure out which one is best in circumstances. So there, there were earlier questions, and I would like to bring this back to, to Kent before our time ends. Uh, before that, Matthew, there, there was a question that, that was raised earlier during the preparation of this class uh, by Aaron on what constitutes transgression uh, against nature. And you, you've provided two, two examples here, um, uh, you know, either malaria control, where there's like 400,000 people dying or uh, uh, biodiversity situation, either you're trying to resuscitate or um, re rebuild um, an otherwise going extinct uh, species or, or protect certain um, uh, natural ecosystems. When the intention is generally framed as good, does it mean that our definition of what constitutes transgression also varies? Okay, again, huge question. Um, so there's- Just briefly, you can answer I'll, I'll try, man. The, the, <laughs> this is, these are huge, okay? Um, you know, when I hear about, is this a, a transgression on nature, my thought immediately, um, is nature the kind of a being that can be transgressed upon? Does it constitute a sufficiently cohesion, or, sorry, coherent whole um, and the kind of whole that could suffer transgression? I think that might be the kind of language that's really unhelpful here. Uh, I think it's much simpler to say, does this constitute a moral wrong? Right? Mm -hmm. All things considered, when you add up all the pros, all the cons, and all the various reasons of, of not just a straight up utility calculation, but also considerations of justice, um, you know, considerations of inclusion and decolonization and everything else on the balance yeah. is, is the right or wrong thing to do. I think framing it as a transgression against nature begs a lot of complicated and unclear metaphysical assertions, assumptions. So I, th that's my kind of quick and dirty response. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Matthew and Ramya on that. Uh, Kent, uh, we have a few minutes left here and I would like uh, you and Anna to guide us on these last few questions. I am a practicing researcher uh, and, in, uh, and as, 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 as is the case, a lot of the gene drive technologies are still really in, in, in the research space or under development. We, we don't have a lot that is uh, out there in, in, uh, already deployed. And as a researcher, our ethical principles are very clear. You know, we respect individuals. We have the principle of beneficence to do good to others by always balancing the benefits and the risk. We have the principle of non-maleficence, never do harm, do no harm. And we have a very interesting principle of justice, you know, in the research selection of our participants, but also if your research is successful, how do you distribute the, 
uh, the benefits. Now, for, for me and my fellow researchers, so I believe many of you guys, these principles are just enough, mostly, for, for what we do. In the context of the technology of gene drive, it immediately becomes clear that these are not adequate from the ethical perspective. And it would be nice to hear from uh, uh, Kent uh, and Anna on how, as people involved in the development of the technology, what, how, how, what direction do we need to look to make sure that you know whatever is good in the research space ultimately becomes good in practice. You know, what direction, how do we modify uh, the research ethics uh, into everything else that is necessary, be it environmental ethics, society and all that, to make these things really work? Uh, back to you, Kent. Again, another broad question, but an important one. No, oh, the first thing I would say is, I think you have an extraordinary definition of being a researcher. I doubt that many people I know who call themselves researchers would say that they're obligated to the set of principles that you laid out. So congratulations to you and to your institution for having created those. Um, These I, are uh, international, so <laughs> everybody yeah, has to be right. also um, global health scientists. So, anyway, so, and I think, so I'm going to pick on the do no harm one, and then I'm going to transgress, which is an extraordinary term. <laughs> Matthew, I have to say it's so deeply embedded, I think, in a, in a religious notion that, and by the way, plastics, that's a transgressive act. So I think there are some things, if we want to use that term, we just should have no, no plastics. So, um, so back to <laughs> Frederick, I want to pick on the do no harm part. And I want to, I want to transgress by rule that you're I'm not going to answer your question. I'm going to use your question as a bounce to the, my colleagues, because I have a question for them, for us, that, it, that has been on my mind for a very long time. And it has to do with this do no harm notion. So, because it begs harm to what or to whom, which then for me raises a question which came up in the chat. How can humans uh, represent the truly voiceless. And I don't wish to in any way be dismissive of the humans who are voiceless because they have no power, but they do have a voice. It's yeah. just not heard versus all the rest of life on earth, which doesn't have a voice that is commonly understood by humans. So how is it possible to represent the interests of the non-human parts of the world by humans particularly since I've been listening to this, I just love the phrases you guys use. Um, framings uh, all tell a story or smuggling in values. I mean, humans are such complicated and flawed vehicles for representing even human interests. How do we find one or more than one who can represent non-human interests in ways that are not polluted, conflicted by, by, by human values? And if, I, if there were a good answer to that, I think I'd die happy and I'd go work for the institution that would have that as a value. So I guess Anna's the designated one since she, this is our time. So right. Anna, please. If you had your dog. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is, this is a good question and something I also have been thinking about and something that just recently is coming up but in the end you know how do we present non-human nature if we assume it non-human beings matter morally obviously for everybody who thinks they don't matter morally the question is easy because then well yeah we don't have to represent them but I agree with you that's an interesting question and in the end there are different suggestions how that can be done with trustees designing decision makers procedures in certain ways that allow those questions even to be asked because usually at least at the moment most political decision making procedures don't even have the option that maybe a representative a trustee however you want to call it kind of tries to make the case on behalf of non-human beings so that option doesn't exist 
So already redesigning processes that can broaden the discussion in a way that would allow such an option would already be much better than the status quo. But as Kent already mentioned, and this is one problem, obviously, is that who should be that representative? Which group of people do we choose them based on a certain expertise? Um, which kind of expertise is this? So do we ask, for instance, if it's about conservation and so on, do we ask conservation biologists? Um, I guess, as Kent probably would also say, different conservation biologists then have different opinions. So how do we choose? who to bring in. So I guess then we again have to bring in a multitude of voices, yeah. which makes the it makes the matter more complicated. But I guess this is the best we can do. And again, probably just asking biologists won't be enough because obviously such right. positions come with power, um, come with a certain epistemic position. Why not ask other people that have other kinds of knowledge about non-human beings, what they think about it? So people, for instance, that know them from their day-to-day -day lives, not necessarily just people that know them from the laboratory, for instance. Um, yeah. Generally speaking, obviously what Gene Drive also brings up is just uh, research ethics in the research ethics context where that already exists a little bit is research ethics in terms of how to treat animals and lab animals. And obviously, depending on your position, some people would argue having lab animals generally is morally problematic. If you go a little bit further and also think about insects and so on, and you think those are morally relevant beings, then even there you should consider, well, maybe we need procedures in case that take that into account in research with insects as well. Not necessarily saying that that research is morally forbidden, but saying, well, maybe in the whole process of researching with these animals, we should maybe take into account that there are living beings that matter in themselves and have that also built up into the process. And I guess the whole process that already is established in many places regarding research on animals would be a way of, uh, as a starting point, which would be interesting here. Um, generally coming back maybe to your question in a little bit broader idea about you know the role of the researcher and their responsibility, maybe it's just besides of looking at it as a case by case basis, which I think is very important to make moral decisions, maybe the researchers also have the responsibility to zoom out and see their own research within broader social political developments especially when it comes to different types of technologies such as gene drives, because those new technologies, which are sometimes called transformative technologies, we don't just discuss gene drives, we discuss a host of issues right. like yeah. geoengineering and so on. So maybe it's worth it to kind of zoom out and see what kind of worldview and perspective these different kind of technologies fit into and whether this is shaping the world we would like it to go, is the direction we wanna go, is it going maybe in the wrong direction and we need to change course? So sometimes it may be worth it to also zoom out from the researcher, from the laboratory and see themselves as political agents uh, and politically situated. Thank you, thank you, thank you all very, very much for this conversation. Uh, as, as, as is obvious, this is a very broad conversation. We definitely cannot finish, we suddenly cannot finish. We will take some questions from the audience now, uh, from our attendees right now. And then uh, at the end, we will, we will do a roundup. I think one thing, that, uh, a few things that have come that are already very clear, uh, Ramya uh, uh, mentioned to us earlier that, you know, we. This, the, the ethical questions uh, are, are broad. Uh, we can try as much as possible to uh, um, address um, address them, but it's okay to not be able to address all of them. And and um, um, it's we probably will not be able to address all of them. I think it's important that we must uh, address as many of them as as as, as we can. They, the point that we've discussed a lot here is that you know it's got to be context specific, uh, uh, and and that we have to to look at you know what really are the potential gains here and what are the potential weaknesses or transgressions if, if you if you like, and then there are uh, there have been a, the uh, important issues that have been raised by Matthew and Anna from a philosophical perspective, which I think must also be uh, uh, put into consideration. What role do we play in this entire environment as humans? Uh, 
Uh, and also, uh, is it really a yes, no? Martin was raising this when people frame this almost as a yes, no uh, uh, question. Is this really the right way? And it appears from this conversation that there is a middle ground and we have to negotiate to the degree to which we are on the positive or the negative side and try and make the right decision for specific um, questions on the ethical perspective. So I think at this point, we will take questions uh, from um, the audience. I'm gonna invite Karen just to give us a little guidance on how to do this. Um, uh, uh, Karen, do you want us to, to follow your lead on this or shall I just read the questions as they come up in the chat? Uh, feel free to unmute yourself, Karen. Yeah, Fredris, I was posting some questions directly to you. So um, if oh, okay. you want to just look in the chat, thanks. <laughs> oh, brilliant. This is, this, is, uh, this is nice. Thank you so, so much. So our first question is um, as follows. The life sciences are rife with corruption, often driven by the desire for intellectual property and the desire for profits. How can you bring this into a normative analysis of uh, the use or no use of gene drive technologies. I would like to post this question to Ramya. Profits, IP, interests, ethics, gene drives. Thanks, that's a nice summary of the question, Fedros. <laughs> Five key words. Um, yeah, this is a really important question. And I think, you know, in addition to thinking about some of these uh, more financially motivated incentives, there are lots of other incentives that occur in life sciences research. Um, if you think about academic contexts, for example, or even government labs, um, the incentive to publish, right, publish or perish, the incentive to um, <clears throat> have the research be out uh, circulating right through media channels and so on. And sometimes, um, in those sort of transactions, what gets lost really is, um, I think, in many cases, scientists' ultimate, you know, sort of um, desire to, I think, as was put earlier in this conversation, to do good, right? There's an intent, uh, at least we can trust there's an intent for many scientists to do good, right? And so sometimes it can be difficult to understand where the disjunct is between that intent to do good and what is perceived in the outside world as potentially some of these, you know, all of these things that we have talked about today in our discussion, uh, potential, um, you know, I don't want to use the word transgression, but something like that against nature or, you know, all of these sort of contentious issues around the use of, of technologies that arise from the life sciences. And so the question is, how do you bring that into the analysis? And I think part of what our, you know, our processes for designing technologies have to take into account. We discussed a little bit earlier about how those processes should be adaptive and ideally should be able to incorporate some mechanism for incorporating stakeholder input into that design process. But another aspect is um, changing the sort of institutional structures in a way in which these life science tech developments take place to help alleviate some of these, um, what might be considered to be um, corrupting influences um, in the life sciences. And it's, again, not just IP and profits, but also this, you know, does the, the, the motivation to, to publish in order to get promotion or to secure grants in order to get recognition and awards and so on. All of those incentives, I think, especially when they, they are operative within a context in which a technology is being designed for public good and public interest, those interests need to be, first of all, transparent in the conversation. They need to be um, you know, openly um, made aware to all parties. But they also, uh, we critically have to think about how do we modify our institutional structures in ways that um, sort of dampen or, or, or um, attenuate the influence of those factors. And um, in that way, ensure that the technology can be, again, more responsive to the ethical concerns and more responsive to sort of public stakeholder perspectives on the impact of those technologies. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, we discussed earlier the question of experts. Uh, I think uh, Rami, it was you who raised uh, the idea that we must involve different people in the conversation. 
uh, that was important. We then asked Matthew whether we can listen to uh, experts and, and trust them uh, to make the right decision. There is a question from uh, one of our audio, uh, uh, participants here on how we extend this conversation to the local communities, uh, uh, people who might have cultural know-how, people who might have lived experiences, people whose expertise is not defined in academic sense as technical expertise, but is important expertise nonetheless. How do we bring this knowledge or experiences into the conversation for gene drives uh, going forward? Uh, and I would like to throw this question to Matthew, actually. Okay. Um, so we're a little bit outside of my area of expertise, though I can speak to this somewhat, right? I mean, I think the first and most obvious thing after recognizing that this expertise exists and kind of getting over the the illusion of some kind of epistemic supremacy of an institutionalized expert once you're over that that illusion and you realize there is other expertise out in the world that that is meaningful and helpful and, and can end up making what you do better um, the next step is outreach right it's about um, creating conversations um, creating um, lines of communication it's about engaging local community members, not just as kind of people who you're trying to soothe, but actually yeah. turning them into co-developers. And that notion of co-development is a kind of, it's a term that's gaining traction in the kind of research community, especially uh, in low and middle income countries where there is kind of uh, disparate power relations between researchers and people on the ground. Um, and so again, I think the community outreach, these sorts of programs and, and uh, I've given you a couple of examples of what you can do, but we're really developing this in real time, right? This is, this is something where people are coming up with new ideas every day right. about how we can, we can better communicate. Um, yeah, the list just goes on and on, but it, it really comes down to, in many ways, I think, studying what inhibits meaningful and effective communication between local right. stakeholders and researchers and kind of trying to eliminate those, those barriers one by one by one until you have an open flow of communication back and forth. Thank you, thank you very much. And I, I mean, it's, it's interesting you raised the question of core development, which is, is, is gaining traction. And I do hope that uh, in the future, core development will become a discipline of its own and that we will have some very nice protocols of how to do it in specific locations. Uh, if you look at technology as consisting of both the hardware and the software, I think there's a lot of place uh, for uh, communities to input in the software on how to actually operationalize uh, whatever hardware is developed. Uh, Matthew, before I leave you, you, you had mentioned during your earlier conversation uh, a concept called ethics wash. Yeah. So uh, before we leave, can you just explain very briefly what this is and how it plays into the gene drive uh, discussion? Okay, so um, some of my work has been uh, focused on what they call tech ethics, right? Which is the practices of major technology corporations, think Apple or Tencent or Microsoft um, and, other, and other tech innovators. And they are occasionally accused of establishing ethics protocols or commissions um, whose ostensible job is to help guide the company and to behave ethically. But where there are suspicions that all they're really doing actually is providing an ethical cover, giving enough ethical argumentation that it provides a veneer of legitimacy. Um, now, the degree to which companies are doing this is debatable. There have been some cases that are pretty clear examples of it. Um, there are other cases where maybe it's more of a good faith approach than it might seem from the outside. So I'm not going to attack any particular company, but it is absolutely a thing, right? Um, as I said before, and I wanna be really clear about this, ethics washing, which is providing a veneer of moral legitimacy through the use of kind of morally laudatory language, that's anathema to a good ethicist. The good ethicist's job is not to make you seem good, right? It's to consider the behavior that you're engaged in or considering becoming engaged in and helping you work through all of the pros and cons, all of the good and bad, all of the risks uh, and advantages that would follow through when you're engaging in that kind of a behavior. And it is part of a good ethicist that they are empowered to say, not a good idea, right? Um, and I think that you can really, um, if you get someone who's committed to that, and not hard to find, um, you can start to have a little bit more faith that it's not just a bunch of rhetoric designed to make somebody look or feel good. Um, yes. 
the, if I'll say one thing, you know, when you're thinking about ethics washing, the same sort of considerations apply there that apply to um, conflict of interest that occur uh, when you got researchers, right? Most professions admit of some potential conflicts of interest. And right. the key is identifying where those conflicts might be and creating institutional mechanisms uh, that would dissolve them. So third party oversight is a great example, right? Engagement with local stakeholders is a great example, right? right? Um, having review of your work. These are all ways that we can combat um, those sorts of corrupting. And I actually agree with Rami that corrupting is the right word. Those sorts of things that would um, corrupt someone's good faith pursuance of their institutional role. Uh, and I think it's just as true for ethicists as for anybody else that it is always good to have these checks and balances to make sure that they're not just washing things, but that they're actually taking you through a really good faith and rigorous analysis of, of what's going on with the given behavior technology. Right. Thank you so much, Matthew. Uh, uh, let's 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 carry this forward, and I have a question to Anna. Uh, Anna, you listen to these conversations, and and I, I don't know about you, but listening to them, I I, I hear very organized, logical, you know, arguments about what is right, what is wrong. But, you know, I remember in, in I was speaking to a friend of mine who, who comes from the same village as, as myself, and he said, hey, Fredos, when you see a snake in your home, what do you do? I say, I kill it. No questions asked. Good snake, bad snake, just kill it. You know, this is this is what my God tells me. The snake is gonna harm me, just kill it. There are people who would argue that I've got to ask first whether it's a good, good snake or a bad snake, whether killing it, it's really beneficial or not. An important question on this context, gene drive technology, Zana, is when you're dealing with this community in technology in communities, what role does gut feeling or that first impression you get from communities play? What role? does this play in this decision making? And should we even give it room or should we be asking people, I think first and tell us what you think is right? What's the role of the gut feeling, Anna? Well, I mean, depends on what, whose gut feeling you're speaking about. So I guess you are alluding to the gut feeling of people in the community Correct. that, for Correct. instance, are, okay. So people that are affected, for instance, by malaria and now they're asked, um, by let's in the scenario think they're asked by a group of people who have developed this gene drive technologies and promise them okay we can get rid of malaria um, well first of all those gut feelings have to be taken seriously as they have to be taken seriously at face value in each democratic decision making process um, but what makes up a good democratic decision making process is that it's deliberative so ideally, it's not just a process where they ask, are you for and against this? And then we base our action on this. A good democratic process provides information, debate, deliberation um, in different venues so that people can actually make up their mind. And I think some people will change their opinion on it, move away from their gut feeling. And some people will really cement this gut feeling and think, well, yeah, my original intuition about this was correct. Um, and this should be how a good deliberative process should look like. And uh, based on that, then decisions should be made. So in a way, they need to be taken seriously. But any decision process that doesn't deliberate but just ask for the first reaction and then moves on, doesn't look like a very good and just deliberation process. The conversations that I've seen about this technology uh, happen to be in many cases, very easy, very tend to be very um, uh, uh, quick uh, and, and, and immediate and occasionally emotional. Um, do we actually have room to have, you know, a, a logical conversation of facts and, and figures, or uh, is this even necessary? Anna, this is a, a question to you to continue there. Yeah. Um, I mean, facts and figures 
you know, are one thing. So people that come up, you know, bring in this gene drive technology, I'm surely going to come up with certain figures and facts about the gene drive, how efficient it is, how effective, how it's going to change everybody's life. But what is important in this context, as we already established earlier, this is not the only epistemic basis that is relevant. And also within science, there are going to be people that disagree. So right. also in this context, other scientific voices need to be heard in order to provide what is called the fact basis in this context. But I mean, these are not the only considerations that matter. I mean, people will bring in a host of values about things, how they see their, their, their life and their, 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 their life within their environment. And in those matter as much. So if it if there are certain values which are not compatible with gene drives, maybe different moral values, maybe maybe they're based on different religious beliefs about certain things which are sacred or not, they those are considerations that then matter in the deliberation process. Right. Um, right. And, and I mean, I, I think this is an important uh, uh, a point also that needs a little bit of rounding rounding off here. Earlier we were trying to get uh, conclusive remarks from. Uh, earlier discussion, I think this is another important one where as scientists, as developers, as advocates, or, 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 or as other stakeholders here, we do actually have a responsibility to frame this question with as much truth as, as exists, as we know, and, and not dilute that. And, and, and I guess this is a point that is coming out uh, very clearly from each one of you here, that there is no need to try and, and cleanse um, the technology in any way, we have to declare conflicts of interest, if any, but ultimately, at least as researchers, it's important for us to generate the evidence or share this evidence in its ultimate ultimate form, uh, whenever so people can make uh, informed decisions. Can I need your help. There is a question from the chat here that is testing my uh, technical understanding. Uh, I think you can help me. So I will read it as is, because I do not necessarily uh, follow very well. Uh, Kent, is this OK? Uh, no, I, I'm absolutely. Give it a try. Okay. <laughs> this is how it goes. Advocates of the naturalization of humanity on the assumption that humanization of nature that has continued for centuries in the guise of science and technology is harmful to the flourishing of humanity. It in it is in fact, it in fact has estranged human beings from what we actually are. This panel discussion really puzzles me more about the, dis well, this panel discussion really puzzles me more about the distinction between naturalization and humanization. If naturalization is not possible, then the notion of human flourishing would be at stake. And there's a question mark there. Uh, did you understand this question, uh, Kent? Uh, so it, is that a binary question or can I say? I have no idea, I think. Okay, 71% is my answer. <laughs> okay, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, if you can address I, I, it. I, I, think, I think it also helps with our philosophers here to jump in. I uh, know, so I'm gonna give it quick and I see Matthew for the first time has raised his hand, so. Excellent, that, excellent. That evinces excitement <laughs> for a philosopher, so. Um, Right. So I love the notion of, we referred earlier to gut feelings, because what we've been learning in the last decade or so is that we are not individuals, but we are communities. We have microbes that inhabit inside and outside ourselves that weigh the equivalent of our own brain, which is a particularly important comparison. So our gut feeling may in fact be the natural world that's part of us trying to get through to this human obsessed brain of ours, which, which thinks it doesn't have to listen to our interior voices. So we humans have been progressively naturalized as we have learned more about our reliance on the natural world and about our own microbiomes. So I would contest that the process has not been going on for a long time. And that the clash is between the human desire to modify the natural world to meet human, humans' needs, 
versus the natural world's desire, if I may say so, to maintain a flourishing natural world that's not human. So I think we are being naturalized. I just don't know whether it'll happen soon enough. Um, but if it doesn't, the natural world, thank you, is going to be very fine without humans. But nobody is going to miss us if we're gone except Anna's dog. Um, so Matthew, I turn it over to the philosopher. Yeah, so I, I'm going <laughs> put the hand up and, and maybe I should have made room for Anna just out of politeness. Um, is that this is, I mean, this is a highly philosophical question and it turns on one of these questions about what we mean by natural, right? Um, so when people talk about human flourishing um, and they, they can join the idea of naturalness to that, what they basically mean is that human beings are a type of entity that has certain conditions under which it does well, it flourishes in the world, it makes the most of itself, right? And the suggestion here from somebody like Nietzsche, and I'm not aware, I have not read Nietzsche's arguments on this in any detail, but if someone comes along and says, listen, in order for human beings to flourish, we really don't want to be a part of science and technology. My immediate question becomes, well, what do you mean by flourishing? Right? What, what do you mean by doing well, such that doing well is incompatible with the use of technology? It is absolutely true, again, that technology can be used and abused. Right? Technology can inhibit our flourishing, but many technologies have made our lives markedly better, have allowed us um, to exercise uh, many good parts of being human. Okay? So there will be some views that suggest, I'm not sure I understand them, that suggest that human beings only really flourish when we don't use technology. But there are also a whole host of what I think are more, more plausible views about human flourishing that are perfectly compatible with the use of human technology, right? Some of the most famous, what they call natural lawyers in the world, suggest that human flourishing has to do with um, love and friendship. It has to do with enhancing your knowledge. It has to do with, you know, behaving morally in the world. That's what it is to flourish as a human. And it's not at all clear to me that that's incompatible with the use of technology, right? So I think that's kind of how I would want to respond to this, that Nietzsche probably has a fairly idiosyncratic sense of what it is to flourish a human being. And it would be hard for me to understand a plausible view of human flourishing that is fully incompatible with science and technology. Is the human being, is the human community in the 21st century really natural? Definitions again. Um, you know, there, there's been a lot of talk about naturalness and how it's a confusing concept. Um, Kent's mentioned a bunch of other confusing concepts such as love. Um, there's a special tag that philosophers give to notions like this. We call them essentially contested concepts, which means there's no singular meaning that everybody can agree to. In fact, people hold understandings of this that are so opposed that they can't even talk. They pass each other in the night. Um, in the context of synthetic gene drive, and even in the context of the critiques of synthetic gene drive, it's not clear to me that we're actually dealing um, with a heavily contested sense of nature. Right. Most people, when they talk about nature and synthetic in this context, including scientists, tend to treat natural as being those elements of the environment or those states of affairs that are not created or made by humans. And they tend to view synthetic or artificial uh, entities or states of affairs as those things that have been made or created by humans. Right? Um, the distinction between uh, gene drive and synthetic gene drive embodies that distinction, and it's how most people talk about it. Um, and, and so, you know, um, asking whether human beings are natural or not, uh, there is a sense of naturalness if, if um, there's one argument that says, you know, in a primary sense, what is natural is what comes from nature. And human beings come from nature. And so to that extent, we're natural, right? Um, you know, but things can get murky. Is a human being born in vitro natural? Is a human clone, should they exist natural? I, I don't know. I, and again, to go back to what Anna said, I'm not even sure that's interesting. What's interesting yeah, it's, it's, 
Exactly. And I think this is, and I think that's why for some of these conversations, we also have a responsibility to, to frame it and always make it focused on the specific, on the specific question. Uh, in this, in this case, uh, the, the question, you mean you raised an important point of the distinction between synthetic and natural uh, gene drives. And I think it's important for us to always define this as, you know, what gene drives are natural um, uh, occurrences uh, that can be fine tuned into synthetics for certain purposes could be bad, could be good in certain contexts. And I think that the ethical arguments need to be developed. And forgive me for uh, starting to act like a panelist here. I should only be asking questions. And actually we have a question to Ramya here. Yeah, there's a very interesting question in the chat there, Ramya, I believe you've seen it. Uh, there are cases where experts might argue that this is not good for you. It's bad for your environment. But if you ask the locals, they need it. They think it's gonna be beneficial for them. How do we deal with that? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, I'm trying to think of an example where this has taken place in, in principle or conceptually around discussions of gene drive. And I, 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 give, you, I give you an example. Um, um, <laughs> malaria control, mosquitoes, I'm a mosquito man, right? Um, a long time ago, we, the, the communities here who believe that, you know what, you need to kill mosquitoes. It's, it's harming us, it's biting us, it's causing, it's transmitting malaria and all that. There are people who will say, hey, no, those insecticides you're using are bad for your environment. The gene drive technology is bad for your environment. The people will say, no, we need it. Uh, we, we have a, a, a colleague of mine published a study recently where the community said they need the technology. The scientists said the technology is very bad. It's not been proven. What do you do in situations like this? Yeah, I think again, it's a really important question. And I think, you know, we can go back to something that Anna pointed us to in her comments earlier, which is that decisions around the use or deployment of technologies should be the process of democratic and deliberative um, debate and conversation that includes as many stakeholders as possible. Part of what we have to ask in those discussions is, um, again, going back to something else Anna said, how are those discussions framed, right? What are the sort of motivating stories? What information, um, what sorts of knowledge are being uh, sort of equipped to each stakeholder in those conversations? Right. For example, in this hypothetical scenario, where are the sort of risk assessments? Where are the assessments of benefits that are being drawn upon by different stakeholders in their positions on this question of whether to use the gene drive, right? And to the extent that the, the entirety of our knowledge about the risk, about the benefits, about the ecological and social and health impacts of a technology can be made available to all stakeholders, that can help inform the discussion as well. So if there's information that's, for example, the developers of a technology have that has not been necessarily um, made available to other stakeholders, that might be important, right, information for all stakeholders to have when they bring their voices to the table in discussion. And so this, this hypothetical scenario, I think, points us to this idea, again, that the um, ways in which these deliberative processes should happen should be transparent, should be accountable, and should make sure that the information, again, is widely shared rather than pocketed and different or siloed into the hands of different stakeholders. And you know, in those situations, there has to be a process and a, you know, a decision-making mechanism for determining what happens when a certain group of stakeholders conflicts in their um, judgment about the technology with other stakeholders. And that's something that comes out again in a local sort of contextual way is not really something that you know, any of us on this panel, I think, could in advance prescribe or, or, or foresee what the outcome of that should be, but rather that should emerge um, in the context of the mechanisms that are set up in that process. Thank you, thank you. I mean, uh, as we draw to a close, I would like to ask Anna to, to uh, do our last uh, question here. Anna, uh, we have the rise of social media. Uh, a lot of people who are the loudest on social media are some considered to be the experts um, uh, you mind, in a biased sorry, way, would, just because- yeah, I couldn't fully hear you. Would you mind starting your question yeah. again? You were cutting we, out. Yeah, as, as Ramya was, think, was, was talking, the question of uh, social media comes up 
And, and I think that with the rise of social media, you have the situation where certain groups or certain individuals speak, speak the loudest. And uh, uh, there is a bias uh, uh, that is creeping up, which is these people are then considered the experts. Um, and the issues of ethics, the issues of natural uh, uh, versus unnatural, the synthetic gene drive specifically, how do we uh, tune this conversation so that we do not miss the right aspects of the technologies uh, just because we are inundated by uh, conversations, positive or negative, uh, coming off social media, which might sometimes be right, but not necessarily always right. Uh, I would like you to take this question, if you don't mind, Anna, as the last one, and then after that, we will ask each of our panelists to give us their closing remarks. Anna, please. Um, okay, well, I try to be brief because, again, this is a very big question. So basically about how a good deliberative process should be set up in a way that can handle all of those different modern um, problems or sometimes they're not modern, but social media is a typical modern problem for a functioning deliberative democracy. And I mean, you see that you can apply that to gene drives, but you see that in all kinds of democratic discussions that that is a problem because obviously it is a tool to have a um, to have a lou louder voice, which obviously gives you power, which gives you political right. power. And often that political power is in, sometimes in the hands of the few, which then look like the many in certain contexts. And I think all democracies have to have to um, deal with this problem. On the other side, we has also have seen con uh, contexts where, especially in cases where we don't have very established democratic institutions, social media has been a way of democratizing, a way of allowing people to speak to each other, allowing people to set dates to meet, to protest and so on. So here we have a positive effect by social media on democracy. Um, in a way, obviously, there's a broader idea about philosophy speaking, how should a de deliberate democracy look like? But I guess here I would like to turn to more to political scientists, uh, other people in the social sciences who do empirical research on how to deal with these different issues. Thank you very, very, very much, Anna. And again, our appeal to everybody, all the participants, uh, uh, to remember that we all have a responsibility and uh, whichever part, side of the part of the spectrum we are, we all have a responsibility uh, to share the right messages about the technologies uh, with the stakeholders who need it. At this point, I would like to say a big, big thank you to all our panelists and ask each one of them to very, very briefly, uh, uh, 30 seconds to one minute max, give us your final comments. Uh, I would like to begin with Kent, then we'll go to Ramia, Matthew and Anna. I will not interrupt that process. We begin with Kent, please. Thank you. I would just say that uh, we must consult broadly and deeply and seek out the opinions of those who disagree with us and then try and create deliberative ways uh, of addressing these complicated issues. But most importantly, we must question the way words are used by each person who sits down at the table with us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks, Kent. I would just like us to think about what's emerged from the discussion today, and I think we've had a very rich discussion. For my part, I think uh, what I've seen is a sort of contextualization of technology, including gene drive technology, not just as a, a sort of a technical development um, and in their own rights with merits and benefits for improving and addressing, you know, very complex problems in our society, but also understanding that those technologies sit within a context of diverse values and perspectives that impinge on those technologies that can be informed by a wide variety of sort of channels through which information can flow. Um, and also critically that these technologies are always attended by debate, by controversy, by dissension, right? And so how can we, again, going back to this idea of innovating our social infrastructures, how do we innovate our processes to be able to contain and to be able to um, work productively with and through those debates and those controversies and include, again, as Kent mentioned, as many voices as possible in those discussions. Thank you very much for a really wonderful conversation today. Thank you.
Uh, so I would like to thank uh, the organizers of this conference for the following reason. Um, when you have people espousing views, such as those involving the unnaturalness and the attended immorality of a new technology like gene drive, you have people who, whose heart is very much on the line, whose beliefs are very much on the line. And I think it's a matter of respecting them, that we listen to what they have to say, that we give what they have to say a full airing, and yet also do them the dignity of engaging with what they have to say in a critical but respectful manner. And I think that um, this discussion has allowed us to do that and has allowed us to both give credence and ask some important critical questions. So, so thank you for allowing me to participate in what I think is a very valuable undertaking. Thank you. Yeah, also thank you from my side. I found the different perspectives very interesting. Um, turning to the broader question that the theme of this uh, panel was supposed to be, is there a moral difference between the natural and synthetic? I would say, yes, there is. But is it the only morally relevant consideration? No. Um, simply put, we need to carefully have case, process, uh, have case by case assessments, which have to be inclusive in their iterations and the decision making process to make those decisions. But importantly, should we pause and seriously consider all the implications of such technologies, such as dream, gene drives, before implementing them? Yes, definitely. Especially from an environmental ethics perspective, there are good reasons to pause and carefully consider before we move on. Thank you very, very much to everybody. Is there a moral difference between synthetic and uh, natural? Definitely not. Is this the only important question? Definitely yes for the first one. Is this the most important question? Definitely not. Should we continue exploring? Yes, indeed. I would like to say thank you so much to Kent, Ramia, Matthew, and Anna. And at this point, I hand over to Rafik. Excellent conversation, by the way. Thank you, guys. Rafik. Thank you, Carlos. No, that was indeed a very provocative, engaging, and a very interesting discussion. Um, it's definitely showed us different perspectives and has left us uh, all with a lot of lot to think and ponder. Uh, I wish we had more time to continue, frankly. Um, Dr. Ferros, thank you for facilitating today's discussion on the moral differences between the natural and synthetic. And I also want to thank our panelists, Matt, Ramia, Kent, and Anna, for uh, generously sharing your views and opinions. And lastly, I also want to thank everyone else from around the globe for taking time out of your busy schedules and joining us today. Um, just briefly want to touch on our next session uh, in the series, which is titled Do Justice and Equity Concerns Bolster or Hinder the Case for the Use of Gene Drive Applications? So now this session is scheduled for August 10th at 10 a.m. Eastern U.S. time, and it will be moderated by Dr. Sam Wise Evans of Harvard University. Uh, so I look forward to seeing everyone there again next month. And until then, again, thank you very much and be well.